In the years before children, Olivia and I took a trip to Italy, 10 days, uh, Florence, Rome, Venice, and uh, what we figured out very quickly is that if Olivia walked into a store by herself, long, dark hair, she looks Italian, she's Italian, and she, they would say, greet her in Italian, and she'd greet them back in Italian. It was like, ah, family, and it was like, embrace here, you know? and then she'd explain, well, you know, I'm not actually from Italy, but my family are from this part of Italy, and oh, you know, everyone is loving each other, and, and it, was, it was great. She walked in, she loved going to the stores, because she was embraced. When I would walk in the store by myself, I'm not quite sure what gave it away. Like, was it the Nalgene bottle, the Birkenstocks, was it the backpack? I don't know, but somehow I had a big flashing light. Tourist, 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 <laughs> tourist. And I would walk in and they'd say, oh, good day. And it was just completely different experience. Like, Olivia walks in, it's like, oh, you are one of us, you are from around here. And I would walk in, oh, well. I will take your, Amer your money, you American tourist. It was, it was great. So uh, it, we, we were talking to a friend of Olivia's years later and telling her about this, and she said she had a, an interestingly similar experience. Olivia's friend, Jen, is a half Korean. Her, her mom is a full-blooded Korean. Her dad is from America. And uh, she went to Italy to study for a year. And, and so, like, she does not look like an Italian. She looks Asian. And, and so she was studying Italian language, Italian culture, and every day she'd go out for coffee because you're in Italy. You have to go out for coffee. It's just how they do things. And so uh, you, you, she'd go out for coffee, and after like months of being there, she walked up to, to buy her coffee, and the price dropped a lot. And, and she said in, in Italian, talking to the lady, like, what? This is a lot cheaper today. Well, let's not. He said, oh, now you're one of us, right? We're going to charge you the local rate. We're not going to charge you the, we're going to take your, Amer your money, your American tourist rate, four euro for a cup of coffee. That'll be a quarter. Like, here, here you go. You're one of us. Here, here just, just come on, sit down. Let me bring you coffee. It was this uh, amazing moment. Like, this, there are these questions. We ask people questions when we meet them for the first time. Like, where are you from? What's your family? Where were you raised? Like, we have all these questions we ask. But sometimes what we're asking is, where, are you one of us? Right? Are you from around here? Do you understand what, what matters? Are you going to cause problems? Like, are you one of us? Do, do you get it? Right? We never actually come out and say, so, are you one of us? But that sure is what we're asking sometimes. When Pilate asked Jesus this question in the Gospels, so, are you king of the Jews? That's what I'm hearing, right? In the same way that we ask, so, tell me about your family, we're asking, are you one of us? That's what I'm hearing, the, the question beneath the question, so to speak. Pilate is asking, are you one of us? Are you from around here? Let's, tell me about yourself. To understand what's going on here, we need to take a detour and understand a bit about Pilate. Pilate is the prefect or the sort of the governor of Judea, the Judean province in Rome. And at this point in Roman history, Rome controls the entire Mediterranean. They control Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey, everything down the coast, Egypt, uh, North Africa. They, they control all of it. And, and every area has its own prefect or pro, uh, procurator uh, who's in charge of that area. And there are the important parts of the empire. Rome, like in charge of the, the capital. There's Greece, sort of the cultural center. There's Egypt, which is the breadbasket, the Nile feeding the entire empire. And Judea wasn't one of those important places. Right? This is the proverbial case of big, big fish, little pond. Like, Pilate is a very big fish. He's in charge of a very small pond. Like, no one really cares about Judea. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, trading path. It's a trade route. But it's not one of the important areas uh, of the Roman Empire. And so he is trying to like, and we know that he's, he, he wants to aspire to get back to Rome where the action is, because uh, it's part of, here's how Rome works when it comes to citizenship. 
You were either a patrician, a, 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 descended from the fathers of Rome. You were an equestrian, which as the name implies, meant that you had enough money to buy a horse, because horses are expensive. You may know this. Horses are not cheap, right? Or, or you were uh, uh, the next lower class were the plebeians, the plebs. You had rights, but you really didn't have much else. You had some rights, but you were working class. And then everyone outside of Italy was nothing. You, had, you could pay taxes and you had no rights in, in the eyes of the Roman Empire. And, and so here is Pilate out here. He's an equestrian, right? And so he has enough money to, to pay for a horse and he has enough money to be in governance, but he's not a patrician and, and he's out here in charge of an area that doesn't have Roman citizens. They're, they're not even plebs. They're lower than plebs. They're nothings out here, right? And, and so he is trying to get back to Rome to where the action is to rise in power. And we know that you ever notice black, if you donate enough money, they put, let you put a plaque on something? Right? He's, he's doing that. Back then, they didn't use brass plaques. Back then, they would just carve it in stone. And we have the hunk of stone, like when, when uh, <coughs> Tiberius Caesar built this huge triumphal arch, there's the brass plaque, so to speak, on the lower part of it that says, here are the people who gave money, and, and listed is uh, Pilate of Judea. Like he, He's giving money to Rome. Pay attention to me. Right? I'm out here. I'm, I'm, I'm out here, pay attention to me. I want to get back to where the action is. I want to be important. And so Pilate is trying to climb up in Roman society. And uh, the other thing that's interesting about this question, and it tells us about what Pilate is thinking, is Pilate asks, are you a king? Rome doesn't have kings. Right, if you go back into the earliest Roman history, they had a few kings up front, and then they were deposed, and then the Roman Republic is what rose. Right? The Ro Republic ruled the Mediterranean. And the Republic then, when Julius, you ever hear Julius Caesar, right? he, comes, starts, he comes to power, he's not a king. His title is first citizen. Right? I'm just the first among some pigs are more equal than others, right? So uh, he's the first citizen. And he is assassinated. He has a very bad day. I just march and all that. Because, in part, because he is suspected he is going to become a king. Like, Rome doesn't have kings. They have Caesars. But no, they're not kings. It looks like a king, but it's not a king. Don't you dare call him a king, or else that, that's a very bad thing. They don't take that well. And so Rome makes treaties with kings. Here's how Rome relates to kings. The Roman Empire has two major threats. There could be invasion from the north, from what we now think of Germany, or invasion from the east. And so what Rome likes to have are kings that will have little buffer kingdoms. So that if, when the invasion comes, you'll die first and allow them to get their legions together and then go out and defend themselves. So they'll let kings have their little kingdoms so that you can die first. Aren't they kind? Right? And so they have buffer states up to the north against the, the German invasions, which eventually is what takes down Rome a few centuries later. But they don't have any buffer states to the east. Right? And to the east, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, there are some of the greatest empires in the world have come out of the east. And if anyone's going to come and cause Rome some problems, they expect it from over there, right, to the east. And so when Jesus steps up in front of Pilate, and Pilate is told that this guy is being called king of the Jews, and he says, well, are you king? What do you think he's thinking? Right? He doesn't say, are you a criminal? Right? Or, or do you cause trouble? He's saying, are you a king? Do you have what we would now call a constituency? Right? Do you want to play? Do you deal? Can, can you, you want to become a client kingdom? You want to be a buffer for the empire of Rome? Pilate's trying to put, trying to put something together. Right? Are you a king? He's, he's asking, are you one of us? The people will look at it like this. Are you from around here? You do understand how the game is played? Jesus, do you want, we'll give you power, we'll make a deal with you. If, you're, if you'll be king of the Jews over here and protect Romans, uh, Rome's eastern flank, maybe we can work something out. That's what I hear when I hear Pilate ask, are you king of the Jews? Jesus hears this question, and he asks his own question in response, you being put up to this? Right? Have you been watching? Or, or, or how do you know about this? 
And Pilate responds, and he responds with a bit, bit of heat. No, 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 I'm not a Jew. And if, if that sounds racist, it is. Right? Don't get me confused with one of those Jews. I, I'm Roman. Right? I'm an equestrian. I, I'm a big fish here. You, like, he, this is where, it, like, for me, this like, locks it in, that this is what's going on. He refuses. No, I'm not, I can't be a Jew. I'm, I want you to be king of the Jews, I, I, but I'm not. No, that's not me, right? Jesus responds, and he finally gives an answer, and just he, he, he says, my kingdom, it's not like your kingdoms. It's not how you play. Right? My kingdom is not of this world. Were my kingdom of the type of this world, then my servants would be fighting. Right? That's what Pilate is looking for, a kingdom to be willing to fight for Rome. And, and Jesus just says, that's not, that's not my kingdom. My king, if, in my kingdom, the servants do not fight. For if they did, they would be fighting for me right now. My kingdom is not how you do things. I'm not one of you. Jesus answers Pilate, and it's also interesting, he doesn't say, I am king of the Jews. He just says, I am king. Right? He, he's making a far more universal claim here. Pilate asks the question in a certain way, and, and Jesus just... You ever, get the, you ever have that experience where people are just like talking past each other? Like, and, and Pilate responds, and, he, and you can tell he's befuddled. So you're a king? Like, wait a minute. Like, you say you're a king, but what you're saying doesn't make sense to me, right? My kingdom is not of this world. That, that means something very different is, is what, um, than what Pilate is asking for. Pilate is asking for an organized unit to be able to defend and kill and, and attack and have an army. And, and Jesus is saying, that's not how my kingdom works. Advent is this season where we celebrate and prepare for the coming of Jesus. And, and we celebrate that Jesus came once. And we'll get to that. We'll celebrate that on Christmas Eve. And we can talk about how Jesus comes today. And we'll talk about that next week. Today, we're looking at how Jesus will come again. Right? Jesus will come again. And that is what we're grappling with. When we say that Jesus comes again, what type of kingdom does he bring? It is not the type of kingdom that Pilate was familiar with. And he was, he, what Pilate is familiar with is a kingdom, an empire, a nation that is worried about status and class and forced by violence where we need to defend us against them. So we need to maintain an army and have buffer states so that we can make sure that they are under control so that we can be in power. Right? That's not the type of kingdom that Jesus is going to bring. When God's will is done on earth as it is in it, as it, when, it, when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, what that's going to look like in the kingdom of God is all have plenty to eat and good work to do. When the community is healthy and embraces all people, when debts are forgiven, land is respected and healed, and citizenship in this kingdom and the kingdom of God is freely available for all who choose it. Right, what's the citizenship test for God's kingdom? Simple. Jesus is Lord. Done. Right? That's it. All you got to say. Right? Jesus is Lord. That's how you become a citizen in the kingdom of God. And in that kingdom, there's no need for buffer states to worry about invasions from them. There's no worry about us. Are you one of us? Because everyone can become one of us because all are welcome and all, there's a place for, for everyone. And what this means is not just death is no more, but fear is no more. Because fear is so often rooted in fear of somebody else. And if you never have to be afraid of someone else in the kingdom that is to come, there is no fear. Right? I think that's one of the best parts of the promise of the coming kingdom. Not just that death is no more, but fear is no more. Fear itself passes away. My friend uh, Brian Baker is a Baptist pastor in Marceline. This is how he put it. And uh, he, he put it so well, I'm just going to quote him. He says, The best days for Christians are ever, always, inexorably ahead. Home is never more in the past than it is in the future. The eternal, redeemed, renewed, and renewing future in a new heaven and a new earth. 
The best days are yet to come is to say that Jesus is coming again and to believe that where we are headed is better than anything we have, we have ever experienced as it is. For what Jesus is bringing is not of this world, for it is better. It is not a place where we have to worry about us and them. Are you one of us? Because Jesus looks at all of us and says, yes, you are one of mine. Amen.